Greetings and welcome to tonight's program, which centers on the extremely timely topic of immigration, our national policy, and the tensions between competing agendas. Eli, Brooklyn Street, Library and Culture Team BP. We are partnering on this program and latest of many conversations we've developed together. And this one is especially resonant as the coalition is celebrating its 35th year. You can find out more about NYIC by going to the link in the chat. Before I introduce tonight's distinguished panelists who are waiting behind the Zoom curtain, I have a few brief notes for all of you. First, you have the option for closed captioning tonight. You can activate that by clicking the button that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please share your questions during the program. Just type them into the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your screen. So with that, it's my pleasure to give you very abbreviated bios of each of our accomplished guests in the interest of getting into the conversation and invite each of them to join on camera. Start with Murad. Murad Awada is a strategist, organizer, advocacy expert, and executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition. The son of Palestinian immigrants, Murad has spent more than two decades fighting for low-income communities of color across the state of New York. In earlier roles at NYIC and its political advocacy arm, he led electoral, legislative, and policy campaigns at federal, state, and local levels. He mobilized hundreds and thousands of New Yorkers at demonstrations against anti-immigrant policies and steered grassroots campaigns to elect progressive candidates. He serves as commissioner of the New York City Civic Engagement Commission. Welcome. Paula Mendoza is a Latinx artist, film director, author, and cultural organizer who uses art to disrupt, disarm, and advance movements for immigrants, women, and reproductive justice. She is a co-founder of the Women's March and served as its artistic director. She co-authored the New York Times bestseller, Together We Rise, Behind the Scenes at the Protests Heard Around the World, authored Sanctuary, which the New York Times called a gripping work of fiction with a message about xenophobia that's rooted in a scarily real world. And her films include Entre New, Free Like the Birds, and Autumn's Eyes. Paola co-founded the feminist media company, The Meteor, and the critically acclaimed resistance revival Chorus. She is currently directing a feature-length document documentary about domestic workers. And welcome. Tom Wan uh, is an associate professor who I hope will join us in the middle of the program. Um, he's had a conflict and um, I, 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 uh, I think we all uh, have our fingers crossed that he'll be able to join. Um, he is the founder, founding director of the US Immigration Policy, Cent Policy Center of the University of California, San Diego, and has served in many, many roles. His research on politics, immigration, citizenship, and migrant illegal illegality, which I say in quotes, uh, explores the links between immigration, race, race and ethnicity, uh, and the politics of identity. So um, we are hoping that he will be able to join us. And finally, our moderator tonight is Arun Venegapal. Arun is senior reporter in the Race and Justice Unit at WNYC in Gothamist. He also serves as an occasional guest host at NPR's Fresh Air, sitting in for Terry Gross, and often contributes to Morning Edition and All Things Considered. He has appeared on PBS NewsHour and CBS News, has been published in The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Atlantic. He lives with his family in Queens. Um, so um, thank you all so much for being part of this conversation. Arun, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Marsha. Um, and thank you to the New York Immigration Coalition and the Brooklyn Public Library for making this happen. And thanks for, uh, to our panelists for showing up uh, for this, as, as she just said, especially timely conversation. So timely that the script for what we um, need to discuss this evening keeps on getting shredded thanks to breaking news, including what's transpired in the last 
so 24 hours or so and what's going to be happening in the week ahead. So this is an opportunity for us to get up to speed on what is happening here in the city. The tens of thousands of people who've already arrived, the specter of more to come and how communities and advocates have stepped up as well as the national ramifications for all of this. Uh, the latest turn in this story, for those of you who are a little fuzzy on that, is a plan announced by Mayor Eric Adams to take hundreds of asylum seekers who are currently here in the city and bus them to either of two hotels upstate. This has been met with uh, a forceful response by officials in Rockland County and elsewhere who are now threatening to sue the city and to fine any hotel that complies $2,000 per day per each person who is given shelter. So let's start there and then we'll move forward with other questions and areas of what's been happening last year and what's gonna be happening in the weeks to come. Uh, and eventually we'll take some questions from those of you who are um, there in the audience. Murad Awada, why don't we start with you? What did you make of this proposal by Mayor Adams uh, to start transferring people to um, upstate locations? And do you think it's actually gonna go forward or not? So first, thank you to the Brooklyn Public Library for co-hosting this event with the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you to Arun and Paola for being here as well. Um, I think that New York has been and will always be a welcoming state. Regardless of what people want to say, New York has welcomed people for centuries, from Europe, from Asia, from the Middle East, from Africa, the Caribbean, and beyond. And we're going to continue to fight for us to, to be true to who we are as a state. We host um, Ellis Island. We also have the Statue of Liberty in our harbor. Um, and the thing that continues to give me hope in these moments is not government officials. It's ordinary New Yorkers who step up to actually welcome people with dignity and with respect and ensure that they have what they need to succeed in their new lives here. So shout out to all the New Yorkers who are actually doing incredible uh, New Yorker work of stepping up for your neighbor. And what we saw through COVID is that we are only as strong as our neighbors are and we're only as healthy as they are. So this is a continuing continuation of us all collectively looking out for each other. You know, the announcement that Mayor Adams did uh, in this past week on Friday evening or afternoon, whenever it was released late in the day, um, it's kind of like the MO of this administration at this point where they're kind of doing everything on their own. Um, they're the number one thing we have been calling for from the very start of people arriving here is for federal, state, and local coordination. And what we don't want is for people to feel like they are empowered to take you know, the live, people's lives in their hands and put them in these precarious positions either. So we understand that there have been between 75 and 100,000 uh, folks who come to New York City from the southern border over the past year, year plus. About 30,000 of those people are currently in the city's care, which means that the city is providing them with shelter. And the city has opened up, you know, 10 uh, HERCs. They've opened up 130 hotels. Um, the shelter capacity is at its most. So in understanding that, I understand the mayor trying to figure out what are other solutions. But he doesn't need to try to figure things out on his own. He can be collaborating with other localities. He can be working with the state. He can be working with nonprofit partners, people who've been doing this work for a long time to make sure that we are actually helping people get to welcoming areas of the state, welcoming cities, welcoming towns. If you look at the upstate region, right, um, the Rockland County and Orange County are not upstate. They're the Hudson Valley. But um, if you look at upstate, and I'm talking about Western New York, Central New York, um, the Southern Tier, uh, the Capital Region, those are areas that had to deal with white flight after manufacturing um, left. And that was, you know, that had a detrimental impact to the local economies. What actually brought back um, those economies is the people of color who stood and the refugees who came in and actually helped rebuild um, those cities and those local economies. Look at Utica. From 2000 on, there was about, you know, 2,600 uh, refugees who re were resettled there. And now it's a booming uh, town and economy. So what we do know is that our community has been the local backbone of economies, even here in New York City, um, and that happens across the entire state. So 
you know, some of the rhetoric we're hearing right now from other elected officials from elsewhere is sort of expected because you you expect bigots to bigot, right? Um, but in the grand scheme of things, this comes down to making sure that we have a coordinated effort to make this happen. Um, and New York City should be partnering with, and other cities in the state should be offering support too. And that's something that we're committed to doing and working with the state on ensuring that we have people going where the first priority is to make sure that people actually want to go to these other places and that they're provided with dignity and care and also provided with immediate support um, from shelter on. But what we do know is that the city can be doing more in this moment. And instead of expanding shelter, they should have been actually working on creating pathways for people to get out of emergency shelter and into permanent housing, which is what we've been asking for. We have people in the emergent, in, in emergency shelter system in New York City who've been there for years. And for us to continue to perpetuate that in this moment is incredibly horrendous. We need to get people into permanent housing. We need to pe help people get there and ensure that we're helping people set up their lives for success. Paula, I saw you nodding um, along, especially when Murad was referring to upstate communities, um, the importance of those communities who are themselves immigrant communities. Uh, anything you want to add along that along that vein? Yeah, you know, Murad said it, framed it amazingly well. Um, thanked everyone that we needed to thank, both personally and myself, and and to all of the New Yorkers that have been doing such incredible work. I think you know, I I do work in immigration from a storytelling perspective. I am an artist, and I have the the great honor to hear people's stories. Um, and I have heard their stories in some of their most vulnerable moments. And to me, I think if we were able to make the city, this country, reframe the idea of what it means to be an immigrant, a migrant, or a refugee, to reframe it in a way that is, for me, how I see it, is so inspiring and so powerful and so uh, with so much potential and 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 it's something that I want to be close to. I want to be near those people. I myself am, am an immigrant and 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 I have a, a a physical and emotional connection to them. But as an example, um, I I was doing some work in uh, some volunteer work in Penn Station uh, when folks started getting bused here initially. However long ago that was, I don't remember. My brain is mush at the moment. But I I remember that. I was talking to a young man. He was 16 years old and he came with his father, his mother and his younger sister. He was from Colombia, which is where I'm from. Um, and so we instantly bonded and he started telling me his father, they arrived off in the bus. His father couldn't walk. His father's foot was infected and was horrible. And they took him and put him in a ambulance and took him straight to the hospital. So I was asking about what had happened. And so they had come from Colombia and they had crossed the Darien Gap. I'm sure many of us have now heard about the Darien Gap, about, about how dangerous it is, um, the weather, the animals, the disease, the, 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 the violence, all of it. So they were crossing without a coyote and through the Darien Gap and the father um, ended up getting stuck in mud and broke his toe foot at the very beginning of the journey. Um, they fashioned some kind of, of crutch and they started, they continued to walk. The Darien Gap journey, according to him, normally takes five to six days. Their journey was 12 days. So they were 12 days in the jungle. But what this young man did in order to get his, his family across the jungle is that he would walk with other people while his mother, father, and sister stayed behind. He would walk to, with other people to their campground, walk back to his family and then take his family slowly back to where the initial they he had left the initial group he did this for 12 days this is a 16 year old boy that navigated his family through the jungle one of the scariest most dangerous jungles in the world and he did this on his own he also was able to find food for his family he would find shelter and then from there they navigated from costa rica all the way up to Mexico. And to me, if we were able to take that ingenuity, that bravery, th that fortitude, that strength, um, and celebrate that 
rather than relegate it to, we don't want them, they are the other, they are coming here to take away, they are all the negative things that we're told about migrants and refugees and immigrants, if we were able to reframe that and see what this young man could do for the world and for the country if given the opportunity to, to thrive. Um, and I think about that a lot around how we do both the work that Murad is doing, which is, you know, on the ground, hard brass knuckles, po political organizing and building community and doing all that incredible work. And with that, changing the hearts and minds of people in this country, because I think we are so stuck in, um, in contracting our hearts and we're losing compassion across the board on all things. Um, and that's what I want to uplift and remind everyone here that these are stories to celebrate and these are stories that we want and these are people in our community that 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 we want to be close to and we should be proud of. Uh, Paula, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, do you get the sense from any um, people you have met? Um, you said Penn Station. I wasn't sure if you met Port Authority. Did you mean Penn oh, sorry, Station? Sorry, Port Authority. Yes, Port Authority. Uh, and uh, you know how often like we go to the wrong place when we have to catch a train, one of those places. And you're like, which one is it? Uh, the people that you meet, do you get the sense that they are um, quite um, they're closely following what's being said about them? This national fear that's about them, um, which often their voices are kind of stripped from. You know, I've I've been doing this work of hearing people's stories um, around various borders in the United States um, and in Latin America for quite some time. So I was in 2014, I was in the, when unaccompanied minors were crossing under the Obama administration, that was the quote unquote crisis. Then I was down at the caravan um, in 2018 under the Bush administration. Um, I also was very much involved in, in family separation on the border there talking with families. Um, and I often asked people if they knew what they were coming into, if they knew the tenor of the conversations in the United States. Um, oftentimes they did, but when you are literally running for your life, when you are escaping war, when you are escaping persecution, whether it's your government or because you are trans or because you are running away from climate disaster, what people are saying and the tenor of a government conversation on policy doesn't matter because you're just trying to protect yourself and survive with your family. Um, and I think that that's, that's very important for, for us to understand. Most of these people that I've spoken to don't want to leave their homes. Who wants to leave their homes? Who wants to leave behind their families? Who wants to go to a place that you most likely know that you're not welcomed at and start all over with nothing? I don't, you know, I get emotional even thinking about it now. That's not what one wants to do when you're 40, when you're 30, when you're 60. Um, it's what you're forced to do. And, and we have a scarcity mentality in this country, around the world, um, that there is ways forward uh, where we can welcome people that make our country and our communities better and stronger um, and safer at the end of the day as well. Uh, Murad, um, as I was watching this press conference today, it was being um, held by the county executive of Rockland County, Ed Day. Uh, he was joined by um, uh, Congressman Mike Lawler, Republican, but also by immigrant rights activists, a uh, number of Catholic charities, a couple other people. Um, one of the things that struck me was this sort of uh, the way that they were all, I wouldn't say the immigrant rights activists, but certainly all the officials all kind of took aim at Mayor Adams. Uh, few, if any, referred to Southern governors, um, you know, the people who have been sort of sending people on buses up north to New York. And I was just wondering, um, was this inevitable or has the mayor allowed himself to sort of become the face of this crisis and the face of sanctuary cities? So I think what is interesting from that press conference you're referring to is not just who 
was there, but I do think that the message that was also being said was becoming a shift, right? And saying, you know, this needs coordination, this needs cooperation, this needs partnership. And hearing that coming from Ed Day and also hearing that from Mike Lawler, um, you know, was, you know, a little bit not expected. Um, and I think that the, the, the lesson to be learned in this moment is that we need to be working in partnership. We need to be working better together. Ed Day and Mike Waller said nothing when Governor Abbott was busing people as political stunts to New York City um, from the summer to the winter. So I think that now, because they feel like they may be impacted, um, they want to say something. But also, even in that, they were saying like, we need to coordinate and this needs to be done through coordination and we need to find places that actually make sense, right? Like that's the message I heard from them. I think that the piece here is that we shouldn't be playing politics with people's lives. At the end of the day, what's happening as Paula has mentioned, like no one leaves their home and walks a 3000 plus mile journey because they feel safe at home, point blank. Um, folks are, actually seeking safety, they're seeking refuge, they're seeking an opportunity to actually just basically live. And if you or me or anyone who's watching was actually put in a position where you had to choose between your life and death or your kids being able to live or die, what are you gonna do? I think we would all take the same uh, step to actually seek that safety that, we were, that the folks who are coming here are seeking. Um, and I think that we have to actually have a broader conversation about you know immigration in this country. And I think that Paula hit it on its head, right? Like this is an immigrant nation. Yes, the founding of it was gruesome and it was taken from our, our indigenous brothers and sisters. And then our black brothers and sisters were enslaved in this country. And then we continue to have larger immigration into this, uh, into this nation and helping build what we now have, you know, some of the immigrants that started coming here were European, right? Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants, like those folks were also immigrants here at one point as well. So I don't wanna erase our history as a nation of immigrants, as well as a nation that has done harm in other, to other communities, right? And you know, th we're not talking about foreign policy in this moment, but we also have to call into question our government's foreign policy that continues to create situations where these issues are are impacting people on the ground across the across the globe and forcing people to leave because of destabilization. Um, and that's a bigger conversation, but we I, I feel like if I don't mention it, then I'm gonna feel horrible about it later. Um, because what's been happening in Venezuela is not new. What's been happening south of the border is not new. Like we have contributed to these, uh, the circumstances that people are fleeing we, the U.S. has contributed to those uh, circumstances. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, you know, we will always have people who want to use um, immigrants as, you know, you know, the boogeyman. But the reality is the vast majority of people in the United States have been immigrants at, or children of immigrants or descendants of immigrants in this country. And I think that what you're going to see is that people more and more are going to try to make the connection. But the reality is, is that we're living in a moment where we have people crying austerity, crying scarcity, and we are living in a city that is one of the richest cities in one of the richest states in the nation and one of the richest nations in the world. And, you know, uh, we're being pitted against each other. And that is the piece that is actually sickening in this moment is that, you know, folks who are seeking support are being pitted, are, are being pointed to and being like, that's why we can't help you when what we do know is that there are resources to help everyone. It's just a political decision not to. I, I hear you, you both on this thing about the need to remind people about um, how so many of us um, come from immigrant communities, regardless, many people in this country do. Um, but I'm just wondering why it's not a sort of a stickier um, or the limitations of it or has it how it has to be uh, you know tweaked. Is there something about that particular idea that just um, has run its course and needs to be revised, Paula? The idea that we are 
a country of majority immigrants or descendants of immigrants? I mean, it's not a, it's not something that I mean, you can hear this in the most uh, me, uh, genuine but it is also in the most patently sort of like mm -hmm. uh, sort of, um, you know, kind of like tossed off and sort of uh, just sort of tokenist away. And I'm just kind of wondering um, why why it does not, I guess, seem to be working, uh, you know, at a moment like this or the limitations of it, if you will. Well, I, you know, I think the story of immigrants and being an immigrant and pride or that lack thereof or of being immigrants or connected to immigrants, it, it I mean, we we saw it in the previous administration, how that was used to be weaponized um, and how he used that as a political to, political moment yeah. to get people to what? vote for him, quite literally. And so I think there is okay. both fear in that idea oh, sometimes of being an immigrant. I think that there is also, um, sorry, I'm in a public place at the moment. Um, there's fear of being an immigrant. And then there's also uh, confusion. Um, there's also the idea of which sometimes you rides stronger, the, the idea of assimilation of being um, assimilated no, into this country for those of us that are white passing or can't get closer to white passing. Um, and that assimilation, you know, some of the most ardent anti-immigrant folks are people that have descended from immigrants. Um, and that is a problem of, no, that we have to else. deal with it on. And that is a problem obviously of white supremacy. And that is a problem um, that we need to but I know figure you're out um, the disease of white supremacy in this country. So how do we make what? the idea of being prideful and joyful oh, of immigration uh, in this country? How do we make that happen? I'm not exactly sure. It's something that I work on all the time um, with storytelling in various capacities. I, I, I was um, entering my building several months ago here in Queens um, and uh, a few of my neighbors along with our building custodian were outside talking and they kind of want to include me in this conversation. And it turns out they were talking about the asylum seekers and the consensus among these men, these four people was that these new arrivals had a pretty sweet deal. I wish I could sit around and collect benefits. And three of these four men um, were immigrants, uh, Latino immigrants themselves. They didn't talk about persecution or desperation or displacement. They were annoyed and um, you know, Paula, first, I'm just wondering how 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 much traction you think this this idea of you know the of of moochers, I guess, um, you know how much traction that has, uh, if it is you think a significant issue, um, uh, one that doesn't get discussed even amongst say immigrant communities. Well, right. it's an issue, obviously, yeah. but uh, the idea of it is a is an issue, but it's patently not true. <laughs> I I have been there with when people cross into the United States and what they have and what they are quote given are if they're lucky a pair of shoes and a new fresh change of clothes that organizations and not profits are giving to them that they've gotten from donations from individuals right like there there's not handouts um, that people new arrivals are getting that others are not getting. Yes, any child can go to a public school in the United States, but that is regardless of your immigration status. If you are a newly arrived refugee or if you are sixth generation person from the Mayflower, like it doesn't obviously matter. Um, we have a problem in this country currently with false information being uh, going viral and being constantly um, thrust down people's brains. And within the Latino community specifically, you know, WhatsApp is a very big problem. It's unfiltered, uncontrolled news sources that are just forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and forwarded. And, and it is a problem that I unfortunately have seen in my own family, um, where you start to see people go down a path of fabricated lies. Um, I don't know how we, move away from that at the moment. It's something that, you know, within the, Latin, within the Latino community, we are definitely struggling with. The Latino community is, there's a lot of us that are moving to the right um, based off of these stories and these ideas that migrants and refugees and immigrants are getting a free pass. 
Um, I think we need to obviously fight against that um, at all costs. And I think the way that we do that is to get back into our humanity and to our compassion. Uh, this world is very jaded at the moment um, and maybe has been for quite some time, but I think that if we find, if we're able to breed compassion rather than breed hate, that is the pathway forward. So people can start to also use their analytical brain that these ideas that are being told to them via WhatsApp um, and other mediums are just, are just lies. They're lies and we have to call them what they are. And obviously the media plays a, a large part in, in either pushing those stories forward or helping them get stopped in their tracks. Uh, Murad, anything to add? I'm just kind of uh, curious about if this is something you also deal with in, in, in terms of this kind of from New York City's immigrant communities, uh, this kind of ambivalence or even hostility. I think, you know, migration is not new to New York, right? People have been migrating to New York for decades. The only difference in this moment of this recent increase in asylum seekers and migrants coming to New York has been that they are in need of shelter. You know, I started off earlier in my comments saying that 75 to 100,000 people came and are here in New York, but only 30,000 are in the care of the city. So the pattern of being able to come to New York and be able to crash with a friend or a family member until you're on your feet continues. A great deal of the folks who have come here have done that or have been able to get out of shelter and then set up their new lives here. So I'm sorry, I'm also in a semi-private space, but like folks are walking around. So I don't know if you hear other noises. Um, but, you know, I think that what we're seeing right now is folks who have absolutely no support or connection to the city are the ones who are going into the shelter system and they deserve support as well. And I think that we as New Yorkers have always stood up to support people in need and we'll, we're gonna continue to do that. I think that you have people, you know, we have folks who are out there, you know, with ulterior motives, who are trying to look for a boogeyman, who are trying, in every story there needs to be a villain. And the real villain here is our broken immigration policies, as well as the people who are putting uh, people's lives at risk and using them as political stunts, right? Those are the villains. But because we have so much of our sometimes thinking backwards, some people want to blame the victims and people who are actually suffering in the moment as being the villain. So there aren't, you know, you're not really eligible for many benefits um, as someone who is in the process of applying and going through asylum, right? Like you can't, like even to apply for asylum, you have to do it within a year. There's a whole structure that you have to follow by. You can't even apply for uh, work authorization until months after you actually submit your application first. And then you have to wait until it comes in. So a lot of folks who are coming into New York are working within the informal economy too. So, you know, people are trying to um, be self-sustaining and get out as quickly as possible. Some folks actually need help, especially people with children. Uh I see a question from uh, someone in our audience that um, hasn't identified themselves, but I, I think it's an interesting question. Murad, maybe you can, maybe you have an answer for this. Why didn't these upstate New York residents file lawsuits on Florida and Texas when they transferred the immigrants to New York? New York City is out of capacity. I suppose another question I would ask is if they're filing lawsuit against New York City, why did, did New York City ever consider, to your knowledge, filing lawsuit against Southern states? Do a question if you, if you, if either of those uh, makes sense to you. Yeah, I think that the I don't know about if the city considered filing a lawsuit, um, but you know I don't know what a lawsuit would mean if they were to be filed by these other folks in the Hudson Valley, right? Like there is um, there's different policies on the books of how folks have can be moved between municipalities and throughout the state. Um, you can sue, but it doesn't, it won't lead to anything. You have to give informed, you have to inform the locality, which I believe the city did do. So there's a lot of different pieces that are being picked up here. I think people are saying things for the sensationalization of it. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what we need to move away from is, you know, emboldening people who are threatening to you again, continue to use people in this way um, for political gains. Like, you know, every year is an election year is what I tell people. So there's always that 
motive from folks to want to run for, you know, have a platform that they're pushing. Um, I think we have to center ourselves as New Yorkers and center ourselves as humans in values that we all want for our, for our, our, our own, right? So being able to say that if I ever need help, I want to be able to, to receive that help. If I'm ever um, down on my luck, I want to be able to have some sort of support. And that's why safety nets are really important. Um, and the city needs to continue to ensure that we are strengthening our safety nets, but also ensuring that we're taking care of folks who are in need. Um, and I go back to something I said earlier, again, the city needs to really invest in getting people out of emergency shelter and into permanent housing. This began, like the reason why everyone's pushing the whole shelter narrative right now is our shelter system has been broken. It's been broken for decades. And no one has actually tried to get this fixed. Um, and I would say it's been broken and continues to be broken because black and brown people are the ones who are occupying that space. And you know, families have to stay in there more than 500 days to even get navigate how to get placement into permanent housing. Um, so we have tons of people who've been in shelter even before you know, the asylum seekers and migrants came into the shelter system, right? So when we're talking about getting people out, we mean start with the folks who've been there for a very long time and support them into getting into permanent housing, but also then don't close the door on people who can get into permanent housing and expand that so everyone who needs it is able to get into it. Paula, uh, do, you, do you think that the popular culture has been responding to um, anything that we're seeing? Is it too soon? Or do you think it is sort of manifesting in, you know, in, in, in interesting ways to you? You know, I think that there was, I was very heartened um, in the previous administration, the way the response by in the artist response, the cultural response of protection and love and positive uplifting stories, the use of social media to galvanize people um, around hor horrible policies. We were able to stop a lot of very bad federal ideas and laws that were implemented. Um, as we know, and as it's been just or as it's been discussed, and I hope most people know, with this current administration, um, he has not been great on immigration. And I think that that is important to say. Um, but when he took when he came into office, um, that fire, that impulse, that protection, that community to help immigrants, I think has tapered down. Um, and I think that that has been a reflection and has been reflected in the popular culture and the popular discourse and narrative around immigration. Um, those that were invested on immigration in the moment um, a few years back are no longer as invested in immigration. Um, I feel that we are back to people who have been, the people that were working in immigration before Trump um, are back and st still staying in this current fight um, under Biden. I think we need to put pressure um, under Biden still with regards to so much uh, on an immigration front. Um, I think artists and storytellers need to continue to tell those stories. Um, and I think that, you know, the tactics that were used in the previous administration grants now seeing tactics being used on other vulnerable communities um, those same exact tactics uh, specifically I'm talking about trans kids um, for political gain for political ploys right and so if we if our movements were less siloed if the stories that we were telling were less siloed that were more intersectional and that if we were organizing across the board um, we would be stronger they wouldn't be able to harm us and hurt us and continue to use the same tactics on immigration, abortion, trans rights. It's the same playbook. Um, and the legislation that's being pushed in Florida with regards to trans kids and the craziest immigration law that was just was about to be signed, like it's all connected. Um, and I, 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 it keeps me up at night. I'm not sure. We, how how I feel that we're prepared. Oh, sorry, am I cutting up? A bit, yeah. I was sure you ended on a dramatic pause, but please complete your thought if you need to. I just stay up at night thinking about it and I don't have answers fully, but I have trust and hope and um, 
belief in leaders like Murad that can get us where we need to go and mobilize us and organize us and tell us how to get there. Uh, Murad, uh, Title 42 expires in the coming week, as I understand it. Um, could you explain to our audience very briefly uh, what that means? Uh, and also, is there a specific day? Are we, we expect some sort of sudden change uh, to, to happen? Um, so Title 42 ends on May 11th, just in a few days. And when that expires, because that's, you know, background information for people who don't know, Title 42 is a public health policy. And it was a public health policy that was put in place for the first time ever at the southern border, because it's not supposed to be uh, immigration policy. It's supposed to be an interior policy, a, a, you know, a policy that takes effect within the states um, to actually prohibit people from actually entering the United States from the southern border. There was a list of countries that were added to this uh, policy. Um, it was kind of like a Stephen Miller, Donald Trump anti-immigrant special that they, you know, put together. Um, and they did it in, you know, the heat of COVID and they can, it continued to live on up until, you know, May 11th in a couple of days, uh, you know, Biden had promised to rescind it when he first got into office, he didn't. Um, and then when he tried to, um, he kind of like flip-flopped on it and then it got sued when he tried rescinding it. And then, you know, there was a number of different things that happened, um, throughout the, you know, the, the rescission of it. So, it was announced that, you know, as, as per Congress and as per President Biden, COVID's no longer a thing. Um, so they're, they're rescinding all public health policies, including Title 42. Um, Congress actually did this a couple of weeks ago where they rescinded all the federal um, public health protections. And Biden is also rescinding Title 42 as of May 11th. That was supposed to be the deadline that everything got rescinded, but Congress wanted to be like, no, we're getting back to you know, status quo pre-COVID, even though we're still living through COVID. Um, so that's what Title 42 is. It's going to be lifted, but then Title 8 takes effect, which isn't, you know, a great policy either, which actually has um, expedited removal at the border, um, has a number of different restrictions. The Biden administration just launched um, a couple of good things, but then a bunch of other things, like they're limiting asylum and almost making it nearly impossible to get to the southern border to claim asylum or to apply for asylum at the southern border. They're creating processing centers in other countries. Um, and, you know, some of these countries also have their own human humanitarian uh, human rights violations. Uh, and they're being, these processing centers are being placed in those countries. So we are uh, pretty much banning asylum under this presidency. And that's what is the most disheartening piece about, um, you know, I always tell people that, you know, we need to be worried about humankind and not about any partisan stuff, right? We as a people should not be thinking about why are we struggling so much? You know, I'm seeing some questions pop up about like, you know, well, things are hard right now. There, our government has bailed, like for instance, I'm gonna give you an example. The Silicon Valley bank situation that happened a couple of weeks ago, within a day, less than a day, that bank was bailed out. Then a few days later, other banks started to trickle out and kind of have the same impact that they had. And, you know, government stepped in and fixed that solution. Why are we not fixing solutions of poverty in this country as quickly as we are bailing out banks? Like that should be the question that we're asking ourselves too about what our elected officials and what people in power are doing to prioritize our collective needs. So, you know, I think the scarcity mentality also scares people. Um, and when you hear about it, you, it kind of like makes you, it makes it hard to think about abundance. It makes it hard to think about what is possible, right? And to think about the opportunities that are, are in front of us. So Title Eight is just as bad um, as Title 42, probably worse, these processing centers. While there is some glimmer of hope um, with some of the changes that happen, people still need to check in on CBP One app, which has been crashing. Um, to make an appointment to come um, and check in. Uh, there's a number of different barriers that were also put in place, but you know, the one silver lining is that there is another avenue of a pathway into the country that was also opened up, um, which is if you have a pending family reunification application um, that you would then be able to be paroled in if your family that applied for you to come into the country 
um, continue, is able to support you. So that's a good thing out of all this mess, but it still doesn't equalize um, the harm that's being done by uh, this administration on the federal level. So Murad, the, this idea that we're seeing in headlines uh, a lot recently that the lifting of uh, the ending of Title 42 is likely to lead to a, a surge um, in, in people crossing the border and arriving in communities like our own, uh, would you say this is a, you know, this is a just willfully misleading or what? No one really knows what's going to happen because you, you don't know if the rescission of Title 42 gets sued midnight, you know, May 10th um, before it's supposed to get rescinded. You don't know if Title 8 get th there's so many unknowns to actually give a clear answer on this question, right? Um, and for people prophesizing about like what is going to happen, um, it's kind of like, it, it's the unknown. It's like, if you can guess the, the winning lottery numbers for the Powerball, let me know first. Um, I wanna run that dollar ticket. But um, I, I, and even if there was an increase in people coming over the Southern border, you know, the border has been shut down. There are people who have been waiting for their number to be called to be able to come in. So it doesn't, in, in the grand scheme of things, there's no way of predicting what can happen, but there are people who have been waiting and many people who have been waiting. And this is the other piece that I also wanna note is that seeking asylum is a human right, but it's also a legal US right. And it's also a international right. So there are treaties that we have signed onto as a nation. We have US law on the books that allows people to seek asylum in this country. And what we're seeing this administration try to do is gut that process. And it hasn't happened yet, but it may potentially happen. Uh, I'm going to read a comment from Christina Zill, one of our audience members. Uh, not a question so much as a comment, but she says, one must look at the whole picture. New Yorkers, as well as the general population in the U.S., are presently afraid for the coming recession slash inflation slash loss of jobs when tends to batten down the hatches and worry about your own family when there is poverty slash fear of losing a rent stabilized apartment slash paying 50% of your income on rent slash going to churches to give food supplements. Um, I just kind of put that out there um, and then uh, feel free either of you if you want to respond to it, but I will also read out a question um, from uh, Sherry Naxon, I'm not sure if it's Sherry or Sherry, sorry if I got that wrong, uh, who says, could you talk more about how scarcity mentality feeds the bigotry and fear of asylum seekers? How do we combat that? Um, Paula, would you like to take that first? I don't and, thought. And, and I'll just briefly respond to the comment. I think all of those fears are valid, but I think we can hold on to those fears and still be compassionate and still uh, be generous and still find a way forward as a community. I think that that's the most important thing. I am not denying the struggle of people here in the United States that is real. It's a real struggle. But I think that what we need to do is come together, work as a community and figure out how to take the resources that are a lot and have them be uh, divided, given given to um, equally to those that are in need. So I, I don't I don't think it's an either or, and I think that's part of the scarcity mentality. It's like, I have to be okay. And when I'm okay, then that's fine because there's just enough for me. There's not enough for everybody. Um, and I think that we need to fight against that and really find ways in which to say, well, maybe I don't need all of this. Maybe I am okay with a, a lot less so that everybody can have a lot more. And I know that gets to be very scary for people in the United States because it sounds like socialism, but that's not exactly what I'm saying. Um, with regards to compassion or with regards to this scarcity mentality and how we how we how we fight against that. Um, I mean, I spoke to it earlier. I, I am a firm believer in storytelling. I am a firm believer of proximate storytelling. Um, I'm a firm believer in talking to your neighbor um, in asking questions and reading about other people. Um, you know, there's this really beautiful book. It's one of my favorite books. It's called Tell Me How It Ends um, by Valeria. I forget Valeria's last name. It's a short book. It's like 100 pages. You could read it probably in an hour and a half. 
it will rip your heart open. Uh, but it's a nonfiction book about Valeria. She is Mexican and she goes and she translates for young kids who are unaccompanied minors coming into the United States. And it's their process of going through asking for asylum as an unaccompanied minor. So it's a child that came to the United States alone. I don't see how one can read that book and not have not only just compassion for the young people and the children that are in that book, uh, but want to learn more and want to find a way to, to find a way forward, to find a pathway forward, to find a way to help. And I think that that's how we get out of the scarcity mentality. When we go and actually help others um, in our own times of need uh, is one of the most selfless acts, but also one of the most powerful acts um, that one can do. I, I wonder if either of you have thoughts about um, getting back to that, that incident I recounted a little while ago when I met these four neighbors of mine and I thought, oh, they're going after these very vulnerable people. Uh, but their first thought was not to ask, um, why are there people who have such extraordinary wealth in this country and how are they facilitating or, or complicit in this issue? Um, and I guess keeping with the, 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 the thread of popular culture, um, I see more and more of these depictions of people um, who are extraordinarily wealthy, right? The, the 0.1% in this country, it's like TV series, streaming series and whatnot. And I'm wondering if, if you see anything that's bubbling up. To my, in my opinion, these are, these are more entertainment than savage social critiques. But I'm kind of curious if you, uh, Paula, and perhaps you, Murad, as someone who's paying attention as well, think that there is something that is emerging about a more forceful critique of extraordinary wealth inequality and inequalities of power as well. I, I've seen some of those shows. I'm at my limit of the rich white people shows to be quite honest that are like not nice people. I'm like, I can't watch any yeah. more of these shows. Yeah. Uh, what started off as I think like an interesting insight to a community of people that the majority of us don't have access to has become, and there's always been that intrigue and you know we can call out those popular culture, those people in popular culture throughout history. But now I think has become actually an unhealthy obsession. And I don't know if it's a critique anymore, actually. I think that it's a, a matter of like enjoyment and yes, they're quote unquote bad people, but I think part of the illness of capitalism is that we actually deep inside want to have those lives and we want to have that power and we want to control those people. Um, and I think those shows are doing so well because it is actually feeling something that some of us secretly or not so secretly desire. Uh, so I want to go back to the storytelling and to the stories of the majority of us of what is the beautiful struggle? What is the poetry in the uh, in 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 family and and struggling through something together, not fighting about hundreds of billions of dollars? Um, I want to. I want stories that I can relate to, that show my community, that um, show our struggles in 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 compassionate and real ways, because that's the majority of us. And I think that's that's what we have to remember that we are indeed the majority, even when what we're seeing in the narrative tries to tell us that in many ways we're not, or that our stories are insignificant. Um, you know. Uh, Antified was a story about family and a restaurant and Mexicans in LA. And that's a lot of people in this country. Um, and I, and those are, that, that's what I want to celebrate. And that's what I want to um, get into our hearts because I think that will reopen up our hearts. As I've said, I think the United States, the Americans are suffering from a mass contraction of the heart. And so we have to re-engage and reopen our heart via storytelling. Uh, Murad, we have just a couple minutes left and then we need to wrap up. Um, anything you want to add or anything that what Paula said kind of um, uh, specifically resonates with you in terms of where we're at as a society? I do think that there is this uh, 
thought process of I forgot the name of the show and I've been this is how like untuned I am to pop culture but it was not a show it was a movie it was like crazy rich something right Asians, Asians. yeah and you know it I watched it and I watched it with my family because we want to support you know our community on the big screen and I was like this is the worst of the things that we could be watching because it's not actually attainable um but it's also like that gimmick right of like it is possible and that's what the promise of this country is, is that you can come here and set up a new life and have the promise of being able to set up a new life be safe and be able to um you know have things that you would never have back home, be it protections, be it rights, be it the right to education, a better educate, like there are different things for why people come here, like, right? Like that is what it comes down to. Um, and in this moment, I think, you know, that question about like people being worried, right? With the economy, with inflation, with um, being able to pay rent. Um, you know, I don't want to keep skate like pointing my finger, but the real villain in every single one of those things that is being mentioned is how can our elected officials actually show up for us, right? And like that's what it comes down to. Um, when we're talking about the economy, when we're talking about investments from our public tax dollars, when we pay the taxes, those are our tax dollars. How are they going into supporting our communities? Um, you know, our state budget was over a month late. Um, some of the big fights in the that were happening did not win, right? Like we wanted to make sure that people had housing uh, vouchers if they ever needed them, right? If they were about to get evicted, we wanted to have eviction um, protection clauses in there. We wanted to make sure that people who need a lawyer can get one for housing court or immigration court, um, so that people can actually stay in their homes regardless of what their circumstance may be to be able to afford a lawyer or be able to stay with their family and not be separated and going into the broken immigration system and having to defend yourself because you don't have a right to an attorney. So we have to talk about what our state's priorities are that our elected officials at the state level are dictating and then what's happening at the local level, right? Our mayor released his executive budget a week or two ago and in that he was gutting social services. And I know that when people hear, oh, well, we have this big crisis on our hands. The real crisis we are dealing with and we have been dealing with is an affordability crisis. And it's not unique to just New York City. It's been happening across this country. And I think that there's a number of different reasons why it continues to get to the point where it is now. But we need to be talking about how we keep people and specifically the most marginalized and vulnerable people within our communities, regardless if they've been here 50 years, 100 years, or five days or 10 days, right? We have to make sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable because as we do that, we all rise up together. And that's what I would, that's how I would respond to that question about like that, that fear that we all have of like, what if I lose my job? I'm working paycheck to paycheck. Like, and to be honest with you, the people who are most generous tend to be those people, right? Um, the people who came on day one and continue to be at the Port Authority are people who are um, folks who are working class New Yorkers, people from NYCHA, the NYCHA leaders, I give them so much respect and power to them because they stepped up across all of uh, Manhattan NYCHA managers who stepped up and brought in people to uh, come out and support. So like, I see who is actually coming out. I see who's supporting. And the vast majority of the people are the people who are, um, that that question is referencing, right? Because they know the struggle and they know how hard it is. Um, and if it's not their time, it's their donations of resources or food, or, you know, at times some money, whatever it is, everyone has stepped up. And I think that the people that, you know, we should not be pointing our finger at each other in this moment. We need to be thinking about how we can actually all rise up together. Thank you, Murad, for ending on that note. Um, thanks to you both, uh, Murad Awada and Paula Mendoza. Uh, Paula mentioned a book earlier, she's searching for the author, and uh, the name of the book is Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions. It's a book by Valeria Luiselli, I think, or Luiselli. Um, you can also check out a book known as called Sanctuary, written by none other than Paula Mendoza. And I will leave it at that. Thanks to all of you for being here for this conversation. And, and I wanna chime in too, and thank you Arun for leading this conversation. And I wanna thank you all for the work that you do um, uh, and for your framing of the issues with such clarity and urgency tonight. Um, thank you all for attending. Thank you all for listening. And I wish everyone um, a good night. Good night.